welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit macrohive.com. Greetings and welcome, uh, Nouriel, to the podcast. I've long wanted to have a conversation with you. I've been following your work for years. It's hard to ignore you, I have to say. So it's great to have you on. Uh, great being with you, Bilal. Uh, I have great respect for what you do. So it's a pleasure being on the podcast. Great. Now, before we go into the, the meat of our conversation, I wanted to ask you something about your origin story. What did you study at university? Was it inevitable you'd end up in economics and finance in that whole whole arena? And t- just tell us something about your journey up until this point. Yeah, you know, um, I ended up doing international macro, I think, in part because uh, I come from a very mixed background. I was born in Turkey, but my family is a uh, Jewish Persian. So when I was a year old, we left Turkey, went to Iran, to Tehran. By the age of three, I was in Israel, near Tel Aviv. And then by the age of four, we moved to Milano. <clears throat> then I grew up in Milano. And uh, I was growing up in Italy in the 60s, early 70s, where there was a significant amount of economic and social turmoil. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Italy became in the 70s one of the sick men of Europe, mm-hmm. having high inflation. And of course, there was stagflation and so on. So... Already in my mid-teens, I think I discovered economics. First, I was a pseudo-Marxist, like every, <laughs> uh, every son or daughter of a middle-upper-class bourgeoisie in Italy. You were left of the center. But then from, uh, from Marx, I discovered John Maynard Keynes and, and became a limousine socialist. And then I kind of a bourgeois economist. <laughs> so I knew from early on that I wanted to study economics uh, in college. That after doing college, I wanted to go and get graduate studies and become more of an academic scholar. And I was always interested in policy from early on because I want to use economics as a way of changing the world for the better. Mm. I was not smart enough to be a hard scientist and the other social <laughs> sciences, uh, some that sociology and politics, a little bit too soft for me. At least economics was a little bit more rigorous than mathematics. So if you had to change the world, you had to become a, an economist. And I was still a pseudo Marxist and believing that. The economic structures are more important than the ideological superstructures. So to change the world and people's ideas, you have to change their well-being. So I thought that I'd become first an academic economist, but also interested also in, uh, in policy work. So I did my PhD at Harvard. I was initial assistant professor at Yale, got tenure at NYU in the business school at Stern by <clears throat> 1995. And then I ended up in 1998 uh, for two years. Uh, during the Clinton White House, first at the Council of Economic Advisors, when Janet Yellen at that time was the boss. Mm. Uh, my boss, I was the international economist for the council. And then the following year, my former advisor at Harvard, when I had done my PhD, uh, became secretary of the treasury, Larry Summers. And he told me, why don't you move from the White House to treasury and work with me and with Tim Geithner. And I became the senior advisor to Tim Geithner and ran a, a new office there of economic and policy policy research. So, you know, I started as an academic, then became a policymaker. Then by 2005, I started my global macroeconomic consultancy, public intellectual. My claim to fame is to having predicted the global financial crisis of 07, 09. So partly an academic economist, partly a policy involved, uh, partly businessman and entrepreneur, and partly public intellectual. Those are the elements of my, of my career, I would say. That's great. And, and you, you have a, quite a, a diverse background, Turkish, uh, Iranian, Jewish background. Do you think in some way that's informed the way you look at the world? Well, I'm interested, first of all, in understanding the world rather than a single economy. Mm. I'm a global macroeconomist. And some people become very specialized. They become, say, Fed watchers or Bank of England watchers or whatever not. Or they specialize only in Brazil or China. Um, I tend to cover a bit the world. And over the last uh, 30, 40 years, I can speak, I think, intelligently, both about advanced economies, emerging markets, about boom and bust, financial crisis. And I've seen it all, both from an academic point of view, theoretical research, empirical research, policy, and then by advising people that are in financial market, usually asset manager, traditional and alternative. Of course, you have to relate economics and policy, then what are the market mm-hmm. implications? The implications of all of these things for equity, bonds, credit, currency, and you name it. So, so it's a triangle between economics, policy, and markets that I think I've developed uh, at the global level 
in a quite sophisticated way. There are plenty of other people are doing it, like yourself, uh, but yeah. it takes a special kind of art to, to be globalist in that way. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you mentioned some of your early Marxist influence. I mean, do, do you think you know, Marxism has anything to tell us about the world today? Um, and not, not about the way, the way the world should be. I think that <laughs> pure socialism and communism uh, are utopia. They've been tried and they failed. They've been economic uh, disasters. That's why both the Soviet Union collapsed and uh, China moved away from communism. Uh, but I think that as an analysis of history and economic history, probably the finest work by Karl Marx was his understanding of how economic forces uh, shape ideologies and how they are driver of social and political and geopolitical um, uh, consequences. So, you know, in that sense, I think there is a primacy of economic forces and economic interests and conflict of interest between mm. economic classes, between different social groups, uh, between also countries. <clears throat> and therefore, that core idea of Marxism, of understanding uh, that most of what's happening in politics and ideology may have to do with some economic roots, uh, including the current backlash, say, against liberal democracy. There may be mm. social cultural factors, but, you know, there is malaise. People are left behind. Uh, many people have lost because of globalization or technology. And now there is a backlash against it, against elites, against income and wealth inequality. I think that the <laughs> economic factors are behind many of the, for example, political changes that have occurred, populism of the extreme right and extreme left. So in that sense, I'm, I'm still a Marxist. <laughs> in that <laughs> okay. Sense. I don't believe that socialism is the solution, but I think that also laissez-faire market economies don't work, yeah. uh, Wild West capitalism doesn't work, and the enlightened bourgeois already in the 19th century realized that in order for capitalists to survive, you have to create the social welfare system, minimum wages, union, provide mm. pension, education, uh, health uh, to the working class. Those in the West who did so, successful UK, parts of Europe, US, became mixed economy and they survived and thrived. Those who didn't had communist revolutions like in China, like in Russia. And I think that today is the same story. Whether it's technology, globalization, or other things that are rising income and wealth inequality, we don't address the root causes of these things that in part have to be addressed by providing public goods uh, to those who are left behind and to everybody, partially redistributing from winners to losers, from those will succeed and to those who don't succeed. Otherwise, we can have a severe social and political uh, strife within our own societies, literally. Some cases, cases of civil wars or failed states or things of that sort. So I think those, those Marxist messages are still relevant for today in some sense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and let's let's touch on uh, some, some more of those. You, you're coming out with a new book uh, called uh, that focuses on mega threats, not mega trends. I mean, there's been a fashion yeah. over the last ten years talking about mega trends, which is this technological utopian future. But you're you've instead focused on mega threats. So first of all, why why uh, use the term mega threats? I mean, why focus on mega threats? Well, I was trying to think about the catchy title, and of course, there was in the 80s a famous book, Mega Trends, by John Nasbitt, a futurist who thought that technology is going to change the world for the better and make us all happy and peaceful. <laughs> uh, that didn't turn out to be to be right, like even the Fukuyama end of history prediction mm. turned out not to be right. And uh, as I was looking, I'm an expert of uh, economic, monetary, and financial risks. And usual economists believe in comparative advantage, so I stick to your knitting. <laughs> but I realized in the world there are other types of threats and risk. Uh, there are social, political, there are geopolitical ones, there are environmental ones, there are health-related ones, technological, given that AI, robotic automation is going to destroy many, if not most, of the jobs. And therefore, I identified 10 of these mega trends, threats. And each one of them affects the other and vice versa. So it's like a 10 by 10 matrix that you have to think holistically. And as an economist, you cannot ignore politics. You cannot ignore mm. technology. You cannot ignore geopolitics. You cannot ignore <clears throat> science and uh, diseases and uh, climate change. All these things are an economic dimension. So I went beyond my kind of uh, <coughs> narrow knitting of the comparative advantage of a global macroeconomist because in this world, you have to think about all these things in a holistic way. And uh, the other thing that drove me to this book is that uh, 
I think that there has been a regime change in the last 20, 30 years. The threats that were really not on the horizon in the 60s and the 70s when I was growing up. Now, when I was growing up, I never even worried about uh, nuclear war and nuclear winter. Yeah, there was a Soviet Union, the US, but after the detente, you know, mm. there were proxy wars among them, you know, in Angola, Mozambique, Afghanistan, but no American killed the Russian soldier and vice versa. Uh, the idea of a global climate change concept didn't even exist. You know, mm. there was the Club of Rome in the 70s on the limits of growth coming from resources. It was not an environmental story, it was a Malthusian one. Uh, pandemics, you had 1918 and almost nothing since then. And only in the 80s, we started to see HIV, SARS, MERS, ZK, Ebola, and you name it. Uh, debt ratios in advanced economies were very low, private and public. We never thought about the debt crisis, public or private debt. Implicit liabilities coming from aging of population, unfunded social security, healthcare system, pay as you go, were not a problem. It was young and growing populations. We lived all in stable democracy. Of course, there was mm. division and strife, but not the kind of radical polarization between populists of the right and the left uh, and extremists that you find, uh, not just in the US, not just in Europe, but also in many emerging markets, stable liberal democracies. Uh, so when I was growing up, these things were just kind of not even on the horizon as terms, let alone as threats. While today, each and one of them, uh, we have to worry about. The only one we had in the 70s was stagflation. But the stagflation without the debt crisis, because debt ratio were low. This time around, my fear is we're going to have stagflation with the debt crisis. So we have negative supply shock, and we have also high debt ratios. Mm. So even stagflation, this time around, in my view, is going to be much worse and much more ugly than the 1970s, for example. So, so that's the world in which I grew up. And now the world for, I don't have children, but anybody who is going to be alive for the next 30, 40 years or more, has to worry about really a quantum regime shift mm. in terms of this type of threats and risks that are not just, as I said, economic, but also much broader, social, political, geopolitical, environmental, military, health, technological, uh, we're going to be facing. You know, I never thought when I was growing up that AI and robots and automation mm. is going to destroy my job. You know, <laughs> if I work hard, I'll become a good economist or a good lawyer or a good banker. I'll have a job for life. Maybe I'll do a little bit better, a little bit worse. But the mm. idea that my job will be totally wiped out by technology was not even in the back mirror of, of, of my consciousness. You know, there was the and maybe, high, maybe high winter at the time, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe let's, let's start with the technology point because when people try to make projections forward next 10, 15, 20 years, they often use technology as a starting point and, and project forward a utopian, a very optimistic future. You know, people say, you know, in the 1800s, early 1900s, where the railroad, uh, you know, uh, electricity, big improvement in living standards, computing revolution in the 60s, 70s onwards. So why, why not be optimistic about technology for the next 30 years? Mm -hmm. uh, for several reasons. First of all, we have had 75 years of relative peace and prosperity and mm -hmm. millions of people going from very dirt poor to just poor, like in India or to middle class uh, in China. So technology definitely has changed for the last uh, Economic story said the period from, say, the first industrial revolution. Yeah. But, you know, during the first industrial revolution and throughout the 19th century, we had plenty of wars and other disasters and pandemics, first of all. Secondly, the period between 1918 and 1945 was also a period of massive technological innovation, like the Roaring Twenties, second industrial mm. revolution and whatever not. But uh, globalization and technology did not prevent World War I did not prevent mm. uh, the crash of 29, did not prevent the Great Depression, did they not prevent trade war, financial crisis, inflation, hyperinflation, deflation, <laughs> economic and political meltdowns, and then Nazis coming to power in Germany, fascists in Italy, authoritarian militaristic in Spain and, and, in, uh, um, and in Japan. And then we had uh, World War II and we had the Holocaust and everything else has happened. Uh, massive technological mm. innovation. And we still had massive disasters and wars. So the yeah. idea of technology actually, technology usually is driven by militarism, right? We need yeah. technological innovation initially for war purposes that then are going to be used for civilian purposes. So the drivers of technology innovation is actually the geopolitical strife between powers that leads often to wars. So first of all, because of globalization and because of technology, we do not 
prevent wars. Wars can happen and happen in the past. And reversal of globalization have occurred, like the first uh, great era of globalization ended with the beginning of World War I. That's secondly, a very good point. Yeah. Secondly, technology uh, at the micro level is doing a lot of changes, but in the macro data for advanced economies, we're not seeing the increase in productivity growth, the dynamic below 1% for almost all advanced economies. Now, there are lots of explanations. One says lots of these apps are just uh, forms of leisure. The little gadgets that actually make us waste time, not more productive. That's one explanation. Second one, there is a lag, like the internet, between the time where you do innovation and then you have the B2B and the B2C uh, innovation that really increase productivity growth. I'm not a technological pessimist. I think that we're going to see the economic pie growing. But third, and most importantly, technological innovation, even more so in the case of AI, robotic, and automation, but even others, but more so in this case, is capital intensive, skill bias and labor saving. So if you own the robots, you're going to do well. If you own the financial assets, the own the, the industries of the future, you're going to do well. If you're at the top 10% of distribution of skills, human capital, education, and so on, training like you and I, and I expect most of the watchers of this podcast, for a while, you're going to do well. But if you are a blue collar, white collar, low value added, but even middle value added, your jobs, your income, is going to be totally wiped out and destroyed eventually by technology and AI. Initially, it was routine jobs. Then we mm. discovered that even cognitive jobs can be split in a bunch of tasks, and therefore they can be automated. And even creative stuff. Now AI can write uh, books, can write uh, a movie script, can write a song that soon enough is going to be top 10 on Billboard magazine. DALI 2 allows you to do great paintings in any style by any author and so on. So even the creative jobs may be eventually replaced by uh, technology. But when when there be new unknown jobs that will be created, you know, we went from horse-drawn carriages to cars, so we need the mechanics, we need people to wash the cars. <laughs> Can we analogize well, in that way? Is that, is yeah, that no, a, the a argument false analogy? Is that, uh, we left new jobs, but, you know, primary in agriculture shrank, and then there was the industrial revolution. Yeah. And then the job in the manufacturing industry shrank and went to services. But I can enumerate like how every type of service, whether it's education or transportation and so on, is going to be displaced by technology. I mean, there are 5 million Uber Lyft drivers in the US and 5 million truck drivers. It's only a matter of time when we get autonomous vehicles. Great yeah. improvement for humanity. 300,000 people die every year of car accidents in the US alone. 2 million people get severely injured. If you can reduce that one even by 99%, it's such a social improvement. But where will these 10 million people go? They lost jobs. They became hamburger flippers. Now they're Uber drivers. And even the Uber driver jobs are not going to be there. So we're reaching a point in which mm. even serves jobs. People say jobs that require actually uh, human care, like nursing of old yeah. people and sick. Today in Japan, because they don't have migrants, they don't like them, uh, there are robots that actually do the nursing job. And they're actually more emotionally intelligent than a human being. If you're sad, they can pick up your verbal, nonverbal cues of your face and they make a sad face that's empathic. If you're happy, they make a smile. Most people actually don't have that emotional intelligence, even caregivers. So robots are going to do it better than humans. Those jobs, even, even jobs like the barista, there's a barista robot, there's a barista chef. You know, if you think about it, the recipe is just a bunch of instruction. Probably yeah. a three-star Michelin chef can do it better than a robot for now. But, you know, how many of those are out there? 99% of chefs, I'm sure, they're not going to do as well of a job as a good chef robot. To give you an example of how even creative stuff and stuff where we thought hmm. only humans can do is going to be done by the machine and better by the machine. Yeah, there are people already speaking, many scientists, that homo sapiens is going to become obsolete. When we reach super intelligent, sapiens is going to be disappearing and people say we'll have transhumanity, so merger between the machine and the human. That's, by the way, dystopian, because only a small percent of humanity is going to have the resources to become immortal, live forever, like the homo deus of Yuval Harari. Everybody else is going to disappear. By the way, we're the only animal species that destroyed uh, their progenitors. You know, In the animal world, we come from the apes, mm. but you know, bonobos and uh, chimps live happily among the gorillas while much stronger. The gorilla did not destroy them. But before Homo sapiens, you had uh, Homo erectus, 
Homo mm. Neanderthal, Denisovian, and others, two million years of hominoids, each and one of them disappeared because the, the, the next one was stronger and was and wiped, wiped them out. out. Wiped yeah. them out. So when Homo Deus comes, it's going to wipe out Homo sapiens. And people say it's only a matter of time. In the next hundred years, that's going to happen. I may not be around, but uh, some of our children are going to be around because life expectancy at birth today is about a hundred years. Yeah. So, I've got two children, by the way. So, uh, you know, <laughs> hopefully they're going to birth and become bionic and live forever. Yeah, and be successful. Be hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I did want to go back to your your point about debt. You know that that's often one of the biggest questions. You know, I get when I speak to investors and just just the average person. You know, we have so much debt in the world now. Um, how can we resolve this all? And and this is obviously you, you're an expert in this area. Now, one one way to manage debt is inflation. You know, just yeah. you know, debt is is nominal, and so just get inflation and and you know the 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 you erode uh, the value of that debt in real terms so it, it you know is that not what's happening now inflation will just erode the, the value of debt away and we could end up having a path where the debt levels become more sustainable uh, absolutely and one of the things i point in my book and my recent writing is that uh, the great of the the era of the great moderation is over and we're going to mm. go to a era of great uh, stagflationary instability uh, and stagflationary mm. debt crisis. So we're not only we'll have inflation, not only we'll have recession, but we'll also have debt crisis. And the reason is as follows. Um, nominal long duration debt at fixed interest rates can be wiped out by unexpected inflation. And that's what's happening right now. And I don't believe when central banks say we're gonna fight inflation because uh, not only that leads to an economic crash, a severe recession, but unlike the seventies when debt ratio were low, right now, in advanced economies, debt ratio are 420% of GDP and rising, private and public, where private is how those old corporates and financial institutions. So in the 70s, it was also only 100. So in the 70s, we had stagflation, but we didn't have a debt crisis. After the GFC, we had a debt crisis, but we had a demand shock, credit crunch, we had low inflation, so we could have massive monetary fiscal stimulus. Now, not only we have fiscal dominance, meaning in the game of chicken between central bank and the fiscal authority, the monitor has to blink, otherwise you have a debt crisis. But we have what the BIS folks call a debt trap. There's not only public debt, but there's also private debt that is high and unsustainable. Now, these debt rates have been rising for decades, but during the last two crises, we bailed them out. Those were the high debt ratio. Zero rates, negative, quantitative easing, credit easing, bailing out household, corporates, money markets, commercial paper, banks, non-banks, you name it both GFC and COVID. So debt ratio were high, debt servicing ratio were low. Short, low, uh, short end, the long end of yield curve were low through policy. Now instead, debt ratios, debt servicing ratio are rising because there is inflation and we have to fight it. But then the zombies, household, corporate, government, countries, financial institutions are not gonna be able to survive. They're gonna be wiped out by rising real yields. It's true that unexpected inflation can wipe out the real value of nominal long duration debt, but one, some debt is short term and it prices very fast. Two, yep. you can fool all of the people some <laughs> of the time and some <laughs> of the people, the real dumb ones all of the time, you cannot <laughs> fool all of the people all of the time. So suppose we have a bout of unexpected inflation yeah. and the inflation expectation goes higher. And I'm not predicting even hyperinflation, not even 100% inflation, not even double digits. Let's assume that average inflation advanced economy goes from 2% target to 5-6. If 6% is the new normal, 10-year treasuries or guilt has to be at least 8%. It actually will be higher than that because once inflation is high and volatile, there is an inflation risk premium and real rates are going to also reflect the fact that there are uh, risk of insolvency. Therefore. Initially, you reduce the debt ratio and you bail out the, the debtors. You transfer again wealth from creditors and savers to debtor and borrowers. But then the short end reprices and real needs are going to be very high. And the long end also is going to reprice. And given uncertain inflation, on the long end, the inflation risk premium has to be very high. So eventually, real rates are much higher, mm. even with loose monetary policy, even if you essentially blink and bail out, uh, uh, blink and wimp out as central banks will have to do. And therefore, you still are going to have a debt crisis. Yeah. So central banks will blink out because not only you get an economic crash, 
you get also financial crash. And we saw what happened in the case of the UK recently. And the fact that they got rid of trust uh, doesn't matter because they, the BOE was supposed to reduce the balance sheet, QT. They haven't done it at the time where inflation is rising. And like the Fed, they should be reducing the balance sheet. So them saying we didn't whip out, we just needed the financial stability is nonsense. They're mm -hmm. effectively now yeah. avoiding QT because they know there's going to be a mess for uh, guilt yields. So they have whipped out. Mm -hmm. They blinked. And that, just, uh, just on the point of unexpected inflation, that's a very fair yeah. and valid point. Um, now, when you listen to the Fed and Bank of England, ECB, you know, all, all those guys, they, they keep saying inflation expectations are anchored so far. They look at, uh, you know, the tips curve and they say, look, it's, it's, it's you know, at least yeah. number of years out, it looks fine. You know, Michigan survey, three, five year, it, it, it looks reasonable. Well, what do you say to that? <laughs> First of all, it depends on the measure of inflation expectation use. Some yeah. of them on the some horizon suggest that it's uh, some beginning of the anchoring. Yeah. And secondly, for now, central banks are talking tough and for the time being, they have some credibility and the markets are not yet expecting them to blink and wimp out. And therefore inflation expectations are anchored. But if I'm right, the, and the economic pain has not started because we're barely starting the recession yeah. in the UK, in Europe, not yet in the United States, despite of the first half of the year number. Once the economic pain occurs of a recession and not a mild, short and shallow, and it's not going to be short and shallow, plain vanilla garden variety, because there is all this debt in the system that creates a feedback from real economy falling to more financial distress and more financial stress of the real economy. And in the previous two crises with massive monetary and fiscal easing entering the recession, this time around, mm. we have to raise rates and have tighter fiscal policy entering the recession. And you have inflation everywhere. So everybody's tightening. And we have mm. this comparison right to the 70s at the GFC, where you have both a debt problem and a stagflation problem. So it's not going to be short and sharp. So you get an economic crash, and then you get a financial crash. I mean, even before a recession, global equity down 25%. Private equity more so, even if they don't price it to market. <laughs> and REITs are down 30%. Bubbles in mini stocks, SPACs, uh, crypto, gone. Uh, VCs, growth, tech stuff, falling much more. NASDAQ than the S&P 500. Credit spreads widening for high yield, but not enough. You know, only 600 and business points what, what about the Leverage the loans, CLOs, even bonds. Usually, 6040 says you lose on bonds, you make money on equity. Mm. Risk on, risk off, growth, recession negatively correlated prices. That assumes low inflation. If instead yeah. inflation is rising, you lose on the equity, discount factor goes higher, as you saw this year, but you lost more money these years, not only on yields, but even on 10-year treasury, because the yield went from 1% to now 4.2. That's a 30% fall in the price. So 10-year treasury this year have lost more than US equities. Though yeah. There was nowhere to hide, and even cash eroded by inflation. So yeah. there are other alternatives that I think about, but they are not the traditional mm. ones. So and what, I mean, what, 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 what about household balance sheets? You know, one thing people have pointed to is that since COVID, especially in the US, people got these transfers from the government, their balance sheets look healthier than before, healthier mm. certainly than before the GFC. So when people look at mm. balance sheets, people seem to be saying that household balance sheets seem, household balance sheets seem healthier than they were before GFC. Even corporate balance sheets apparently look are supposedly healthier than before GFC. It's really the public sector balance sheet. So if we just focus on, say, household and private sector balance sheet, you know, it, you know, is this a fair characterization or is this an incorrect reading? It's an incorrect the following sense. During the GFC was households and banks that lent to households. Corporates were okay and shadow banks were okay and governments were okay. Today it's true that household balance sheet with some caveats are better. And the one of regulated banks, after all the liquidity and capital requirement, are better off. But the corporate balance sheets are really terrible. The Fed, before COVID, was writing financial stability reports all about corporate debt, about highly leveraged corporates, high yield, fallen angels, risk of CLOs, of leveraged loans, of covenant light, and so on. And paradoxically, when we went into COVID, those were, were zombie corporates which should have gone bust. They didn't go bust because we bailed them out, right? Mm. Massive transfer to everybody and backstopping money market, high grade, 
I yield everybody under the sun. So they were bailed out, but they were under stress. And the lending came from the shadow banking system to the corporate. So GFC mm. were two agents, households and banks were in trouble. Today it's corporates, it's shadow banks, and it's governments. And even within the household sector, the fall in debt ratio for the US was not driven by much higher savings. Many people defaulted and eventually it was debt reduction. They went away, those debts. So that was the fall in their debt ratios. There was not a significant improvement in saving. They got a bailout from the government during COVID, but a lot of it has already been spent. And the bottom 50% of the distribution of households, those were more fragile jobs, uh, like working class or low income and so on, we have less financial wealth, maybe only a home, some of them, not equity wealth. And they have debt in the form of mortgages, consumer debt, credit cards, auto loans, student loans, and you name it, let alone shark loans. Those are the mm. 50% that has on average only $400 of liquid assets for an emergency, $400. They live from paycheck to paycheck. Once you have a recession, you have a shock to their p and in income. Some of them are going to lose jobs or their income is not going to grow as much as inflation. And they'll have a P&L shock because their assets are going to fall in value and their debt servicing ratio are going to rise significantly. And then they're going to go bust. So even the household sector mm. in advanced economy, you have to split it with it. It's like the corporate. One <laughs> thing is high yield and the other one is high grade. High grade is going to survive, but even high grade spreads are now very high, let alone for high yield. So mm. of course, not everybody's going to go bust, but even the household sector looks okay because they have job and they have an okay balance sheet for now. But once you have a recession and you have debt servicing ratio rising, you'll see even those parts of the household sector that are extremely fragile, balance sheet and p &L based. Yeah. And, and earlier we talked about Marxism and, and you just mentioned the bottom 50%. Why, why has income inequality widened so much over the last 30, 40 years? Uh, you know, I mean, there are actually history books that show that uh, inequality because of social, political, technological reasons is always high. And the only thing that really reduce inequality are wars, revolutions, uh, pandemics, and famines, things that destroy and kill okay. not just the poor, but also the rich. Paradoxically, that's how you reduce. Otherwise, we've never been able to use redistribution to deal with, with inequality. There are economic history books written on this topic. I think that equality has been rising from a variety of factors. Uh, factor one is that trade and globalization increase the economic pie, but as you know, leads to winners and losers. Say, uh, low value added uh, blue collar workers in advanced economies lose, while blue collars in emerging markets do well. Capital does well in general if it's financial capital, well if it's export uh, uh, export competing uh, industries as opposed to import competing, we're doing less poorly, and so on and so on. But uh, trade and hyper globalization leads to winners and losers, and we did not compensate the losers, and we didn't even retrain them and give them new skills for the new jobs. The the guys who had a union job in a factory became hamburger flippers for five bucks mm. per hour, and now they're angry, and that's why there's a backlash against that. Technology, as I pointed out, is also mm. Capital intensive, ski buys, labor saving, especially the new form of digital technologies compared to those of the past. You have the economic, financial, political power of the elites that have gone for their own interest. And there has been a significant increase, at least in the United States, in the concentration and oligopolies in the corporate sector. Mm -hmm. So there is less competition. Firms have greater pricing power, and therefore they can essentially increase prices more than their cost and wages. And we've seen it just during this inflation shock. And finally, workers, workers became uh, weaker because unions became weaker. So the power of labor, of workers because of trade, technology, and politics became weaker. And you had, you know, 2.5 billion Chinese Indians joining the global labor supply. And uh, the Chinese provided the cheap goods, the Indian, the cheap services, and the Russia and the other commodity exporting yams, the cheap commodities. And that, again, crowded out many jobs from uh, industry, manufacturing, services, and even in uh, mining and you name it. So it's mm. a variety of factors. There are also social factors. Rich and poor people don't mix with each other socially anymore. They don't even marry among each other. It used to be there was more 
uh, intermarriage between different social classes. Now, educated college, uh, how to say, people, men and women marry each other as opposed to marry people that have a different social economic status. So even our mating behavior mm -hmm. is a source of rising inequality. So there is lots of stuff. And what about, uh, you know, people often look at the Nordic countries, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, you know, have they been able to deal with this at all or not? They've been able to deal with it better. They were social democratic. They had uh, on one side incentive for private sector economic activity, but then they would tax the hell out of the wealthy. Really, I mean, marginal tax rates of 70% on income and even taxation of, of, of wealth and so on. So there's been a success story, but guess what? Even in Sweden right now, the Swedish Democrat that is effectively a neo-Nazi party has now together with other right-wing parties won the election and they're gonna yeah. be in power. So even in Denmark, even in Sweden, even in Finland, uh, there's now, for example, a backlash against migrants and all the usual argument, those are criminals, they steal our jobs and they rape and whatever not. So the, yeah, at least in some social groups, mm. those are the, the, that kind of anti-migrant rhetoric is there or skepticism about Europe and the Eurozone and things of that sort. So it's, it's, it's a more yeah. greater success story model, the one of protecting not jobs, but workers. So if a job has to change because of technology or trade, fine, I'm going to ensure your income as opposed to other parts of Southern Europe where you cannot fire people even if technology or trade requires them to lose their jobs. So the, yeah. the Nordic model of protecting jobs, uh, sorry, to protect incomes rather than jobs, yeah. worker rather than specific jobs is one that gives you more flexibility to deal with the transition and transformation that technology and trade and other things require. Yeah. And, you know, speaking about Europe, um, you know, many people have talked about EMU breaking up, the Eurozone breaking up for like decades, you know, pretty much yeah. since the inception. We had the sovereign crisis after the GFC and Europe stayed together. Uh, we had the migrant crisis, you know, with the you know Syrian migrants in in 2015 or so, and Europe stayed together. We've had COVID, and Europe is still a uh, whole. I mean, do you think that Eurozone or EMU, European Union, can uh, remain, uh, you know, together going forward or, or not? Well, I would separate uh, the European Union from uh, kind of Eurozone yeah. or EMU, uh, even if a large fraction of uh, European countries are member of the Eurozone, but not all of them. Uh, so far, the European Union has been able, in spite of all the differences between its, uh, <coughs> don't remember if we were 28, or how many members after yeah. the UK left, uh, to keep it together and have a little more of risk sharing of various sorts and respond to crises by greater forms of reform on one side, solidarity on the other one. So I don't think that, and now that there's a threat, existential threat coming from Russia, I think the Europeans also realize they have to be united and together and in light of the US to deal with the Russian bear. So that has been also a driver of greater solidarity in spite of all the differences. You know, Orban and others are going to make noises. But at the end of the day, would they want to be part of the Russian bear empire or part of <laughs> Europe? <Yeah. laughs> Even Orban. <laughs> he wants it both ways, of course. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, he, he's using that leverage to extract more bribes, but there are bribes that are large enough to keep the, everybody within the umbrella, even those who are more authoritarian. Eurozone is a more complicated issue. Grexit was avoided and would have led to a dominant effect. So it was in part also a political decision, not just economic, because uh, you had the migrant crisis and the collapse of Greece would have had also political and geopolitical consequences. Italy is the weak link currently of the Eurozone. They just uh, voted Meloni, who's a neo-fascist. I don't think that in the short run, she's going to go on a collision course with ECB and Europe because there are hundreds of billions of euros of money coming from these EU funds for Italy, grants or, or low interest rates loans. And you have the TPI that may backstop Italy as long as the widening of spread is not driven by poor policies as opposed to just market dynamic. So in the short run, will be okay. Even a Meloni government that is a bit Euro and European skeptic is going to want to stay quiet and have a friendly honeymoon. But suppose there is a recession in Europe next year, mm. highly likely, and it's going to hit Italy more because like Germany, they depend more on Russian energy and because Italy is more fragile overall. And then suppose there is a rising unemployment rate, you're going to have to blame it on somebody. You're going to blame it on Europe. 
and they're going to say, well, we wanted this money as a social transfer, not to do a digital transformation or environmental. We don't care about that stuff. And Europe doesn't allow us to do this. And Europe is not helping us with the migrants and a whole bunch of other grievances. So you can see that in a severe recession, like it happened after the GFC, that's when Italy and Spain and Portugal and Greece and Ireland got in trouble. So you need a trigger of a severe recession for then the tensions emerge and then new existential threat to the Eurozone emerge. But you know, Greece was a 200 billion euro public debt problem. So there was a Troika bailout program of 200 billion that could bail out Greece or better, the creditors of Greece that were mostly French and German banks. Italy is a 2.6 trillion billion trillion uh, public debt problem. Too big to fail and too big to be saved. There is no Troika program <laughs> can backstop Italy if Italy <laughs> goes in the wrong direction and then spreads blow up. Now, question is how much one market discipline, two European discipline can force Italy to behave. Yeah. In the case of the UK, the market discipline worked. Uh, I don't think there was BOE discipline, it was more market discipline that forced them then for this government to collapse and now change course. So I think that uh, in the case of Italy, of course, there would be market discipline and European discipline as well. But if things go really bad, uh, we've seen governments who actually play with fire, like, uh, like uh, uh, Greece under Syriza with Tsipras, where they yeah. started the fall thing and then they had to backtrack and, and go back to the Troika and blink. But you know, in, the, in that game of chicken, Greece had no leverage, it was yeah. too small, 2% of Eurozone GDP. The Germans were willing to pull the plug. Italy believes that they have leverage because they're the third or fourth largest Eurozone economy. So they know that if they go, Eurozone collapses. So they might try to use this one in that game of chicken if push comes to shove. So it's yeah. much more complicated. And do you think Germany is more vulnerable today as well in many ways? Because you know, it relied on cheap Russian energy, its industrial sector looks looks tired, you know, given all the changes in technology that we're seeing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's still a very strong uh, economic uh, power, but definitely the economic and industrial model of uh, Germany was in part uh, based on uh, having cheap energy from Russia. That party is over, and therefore, if there was a more severe cutoff of uh, exports, say, of natural gas uh, to Europe, uh, one of the major victims is going to be Germany. But of course, if Germany goes in a recession, then the rest of the Eurozone is also going to go mm. in a severe recession. So they're all in the same boat, even global supply chains within Europe uh, and so on. So, but yeah. yeah, right now, I mean, Germany is still an economic model that looks like reasonably successful. Of course, there are new technology, but even, even their car industry has innovated. You know, I, I'm not sure that Tesla is going to win uh, the race for electric vehicles. You know, all the German players are also doing their own yeah. share. And for autonomous vehicles, who are going to be the winners is a totally open game still. So yeah. Germany with the caveat of having to now find new sources of energy that are more reliable, more stable and cheaper. But if they resolve this problem, then it's still a major economic and innovation, a technological powerhouse, at least within Europe. Yeah. Within Europe and and if, if we, um, you know, step, you know, broader and look at, say, China, we haven't talked about China so far. There's a lot of talk about the US-China Cold War. Um, but one difference, of course, with the Soviet-US Cold War is that uh, China's economy is much bigger and much more interlinked with the US and the global economy. So can you really have a right, you know, a, a cold war between China and the US if they're so economically dependent with each other? <coughs> well, my answer is yes. Uh, we thought that there couldn't be a war between economies that are connected, but World War War, World War One, sorry, that uh, yeah. all of the first age of great uh, globalization between 19, 1870 or so, and 1914, it showed that, you know, you can have great amount of economic integration and trade and globalization and still have wars because geopolitical things have a primacy. And we're at the beginning of that decoupling between US and China, trading goods in services, investment, FDI, movement of labor, technology, data, information. So it's the only question of how fast and which speed of that uh, deglobalization and decoupling. But it's going to become extreme. I'll give you just a simple example. Right now, in the US, but also in Europe, we decided we're not going to go for the 5G of Huawei because it's a backdoor to the Chinese government. Yeah. And we don't want to 
telephones to be tapped by that. But tomorrow, even your uh, simple $10 toaster from China or coffee machine or microwave or even this cup is going to have a 5G chip. Because, you know, it's the internet of things where billions of devices are connected with each other. And for global supply chain tracking, you have to know where even this cup is going from point A to point B and so on. So if your 5G phone with Huawei is a listening device, your toaster in the morning is a listening <laughs> device, your coffee machine or your mug is a listening device. So once we have that decoupling and every good and every service is going to have tomorrow a chip, it's 5G, then you cannot even allow the $10 toasters from China. Literally, you have full decoupling in mm. all goods and services. Another example, tomorrow is not just electric vehicles, it's going to be autonomous. And the big thing is not just electric, it's to have a system where millions of cars can move together without hitting each other. That requires AI, machine learning, sensors, collecting the big data, and then 5G with the AI, making sure that all these things move around without hitting each other in a synchronized and optimal way. Now, whoever has access to that technology can stop, therefore, uh, you know, some of the asset transportation system. That's why the Chinese are now worried about Tesla collecting all the data about the Chinese drivers. They're saying uh, you cannot collect them or you have to put them on local servers. But tomorrow, if it's a U.S. technology, then U.S. can shut down the entire transportation system of China and vice versa. Are we going to ever allow uh, electric vehicles that are autonomous from China using their technology on our roads? Of course not. We are not going to allow it. They're not going to allow it. So, you know, Tesla is a big problem. They invested in China, they have a big factory, and they know it's going to be lost. You know, Warren Buffett just last week decided he's going to divest from every investment in China. Elon Musk cannot do it. He has a big factory. So what is he going to do now? He's going and telling the world that the solution for Taiwan is in a special administrative zone like Hong Kong. We know how it ended up with Hong mm-hmm. Kong. He's trying to save his ass, right? And the mm-hmm. ass of Tesla. He should just get out of China. He's going to have half of the world it's going to be the world that is the West mm. and it's allies where you can use those technology. And there'll be another half of the world, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, Pakistan, Cambodia, and other countries that are in that sphere of influence, many of them in Africa, some in Asia, some maybe in Latin America, are going to be in the China world. We'll have division and decoupling in everything, technology, data, information, trade, investment, uh, 5G splinter net, surveillance systems, everything under the sun is going to be a divided world split in two on every possible dimension. That's the direction we're going. And it's going to be unavoidable given the geopolitical division. And we'll be lucky if it's just the cold war getting colder and leading mm. fragmentation, decoupling, balkanization of the global economy, of supply chains, and division of the world. The biggest risk is that we end up into war. I'm already feeling very gloomy and I'm reluctant to mention climate change <laughs> as another mega threat. Um, but, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on climate change? Well, first is a serious issue. We are headed yeah. not towards 1.5, not 2, but even after Glasgow, the baseline is 2.4. And most likely we may end up by the end of the century at plus 3. Even plus 2 is a disaster. Even right now being pl- what, plus 1.2, is leading to huge damage every day. There's a story. Look at the droughts, Pakistan, India, all over Europe, including Italy, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America, US. There's a drought started a few years ago from Colorado to California. Massive drought, long-term, because of climate change. Lake Mead, Lake Powell, they're finding corpses of a mafioso killed in the 50s. They're right there coming to service, literally. One third of all vegetables, two thirds of all fruits and nuts in the US are produced in California. The farmers find it more profitable to sell their water rights to somebody else industry than create than producing fruits and vegetables today. That's why food prices were already spiking before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Same thing for energy. In energy, we're bashing rightly so fossil fuel producers because they pollute but they're massively underinvested into fossil fuel capacity, all the private sector ones at least, not the, some of the governments. But the increase in renewable has been too little compared to the fall 
in the supply and capacity of fossil fuels. That's why even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Brent was almost $100 per barrel. And it's going to get worse because that's a structural lack of energy in the world. I mean, so, what about nuclear? I mean, nuclear supposedly is a, a potential pathway for us to decarbonize. Nuclear should be part of the solution. There are lots of political constraints against mm-hmm. it. Even if uh, 20 years ago, 82% of all energy in the world was coming from fossil fuels. About 8% of it was coming from renewable. The remaining part was uh, nuclear. Today, after all the things we've done about solar, wind, renewable, the share of renewable has gone from 8% to 11 and the share of fossil fuel has fallen from 82 to 80%, remaining part being, uh, being nuclear. Nuclear is not going to be, even if it doubles, not going to be a major source of energy, given all the concerns. The dreamers believe that the revolution is going to be technological, but not renewable. It's going to be fusion. If fusion is successful, you create infinite amount of energy very cheaply with zero greenhouse gas emissions. Then you can resolve. In my chapter about the utopian future, as opposed to dystopia, mm. it's not that we happily cooperate domestically, internationally. That's utopia. It's not going to happen. There's too much conflict, strife within country, across country. It's to be major technology revolution that allows us to have cheap energy, deal then with uh, climate change, have lots of desalinized water cheaply, create more agriculture, and then grow the economic pie and do lots of other things. Well. People say even a fusion, if it's going to work, it's going to take another 15 to 20 years until it's commercial and it's successful. And that might be too late because 20 years from now, the planet might be destroyed by climate change. Mm. <coughs> I mean, we've, we've gone through so many of these threats now. I mean, we could talk about more, but let, let's put that on hold. Instead, let's just focus on policy. Um, so debt problems, inflation problems, climate change, geopolitics, uh, European risks, and so on. So what would you tell policymakers to do, like central bankers, presidents? Like if, if you were the dictator of the US, say, what would you, what would you do? Well, in each chapter for each one of these mega threats, I discuss uh, the solutions uh, for each one of them. You know, if it's that, could be spending less, saving more, could be growth, could be default, could be financial repression, could be inflation, could be taxation of labor or capital. Each one of them has pros and cons, mm. and none of them is an ideal solution. The problem, and in the last two chapters, one is a dystopian future where all these threats materialize, and then is the end of the world, and there is a more utopian one where gradually we implement it both domestically and internationally the policy that avoid the dystopian future. It's not utopian, but at least it's less dystopian, right? That's the best we mm. can expect from the world. The problems, however, are several. And I'll give you one, only one example for climate change. There are two sets of problems, two domestic and two international. Domestically, in many countries like the US, half of the country doesn't believe that climate change is, used by, is caused by humans, yeah. all the GOP. So that's a problem. And when the, the Trumps of the world are in power or other Republicans, nothing gets done. Second problem is intergenerational. The young care about climate, but people like me, old geezers, are not going to be around when the disaster occurs. And the old vote, the young don't. So, and there is a conflict because we tend to discount the future a lot in these models because we believe that eventually there'll be a technology that's going to resolve the problem. So we kick the can down the road. Internationally, there's first the free rider problem, the tragedy of the commons. If a country does huge effort to reduce its greenhouse gas emission to zero and nobody else does, then <laughs> greenhouse emission are global. It's not going to make any difference. So there is a free ride and nobody's going to do it. And agreeing everybody to do it is mission impossible. And final international problem, uh, we advanced economies, we created 90% of all emissions in the last 200 years because of the Industrial Revolution. And now we're going telling China and India, all the poor countries, you have to cut your emission to zero by the end of, say, 20 years from now, or you have to cut them already this decade, but they're still either poor or barely middle class. And they say, you created this problem, 90% of the stock is you, Yes, the flow of new emission is me, China, and India, but you create the problem. Now you're telling me, stay poor because you created this problem. No way I'm going to do it. First, I'm going to increase my emission for the next 10, 20 years and then reduce them. Two, unless you give me trillions of dollars of subsidies and bribes that you promised me, and only 1% of them went to EM, 
little less than 1%, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. So you have four sets of problems, mm -hmm. among other ones. The average carbon tax needed to reach class two, that is Paris, based on work by Bill Nordhaus, my former colleague at Yale, who got the Nobel Prize in economics for his work on the environment, the average carbon tax should be $200 per ton. Today, the average global is $2 per ton. It has to go to 200. Wow. The US is even lower than two. And everywhere around the world, what are we doing now that we have a problem with energy costs? We're cutting fuel taxes. We're just doing the opposite of what you should be doing. Which government can increase a carbon tax from two to 100? And which government is going to do it when nobody else is going to do it? These are the reasons why there is so much greenwashing, green wishing, bullshit ESG, <laughs> green fig leaves, lots of talk, <laughs> including Glasgow COP, and no action. It's all talk. There's no action, and that's why it's a slow motion train mm -hmm. wreck. Mm -hmm. So are there a solution? Yes, but it's mission impossible given current technologies. Given current technologies, that zero implies negative economic growth forever, everywhere. In 2020, the worst recession in the last 60 years, net emission globally fell only by 9% compared to the previous time. 9% is nothing. And now they're surging again. So yeah. mitigation is mission impossible given current technology. Adaptation is going to cost trillions of dollars, letting temperature to go to plus three and then limiting the cost. Give you one example. Manhattan, where I live, there was a plan initially to build a wall around it. Then they said, looks like an ugly prison. So let's build a levis near the Verrazzano Bridge. That plan would cost $125 billion. Will take 25 years to build. You don't know whether it's going to work. It's going to work. It's going to work only for storm surges, like in a hurricane, mm -hmm. but not permanent rise in sea level. And even if you protect and save Manhattan, the water rises to go somewhere. All of Long Island, all of the Jersey Shore, and the other four boroughs, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, are going to be flooded. So it's not going to resolve anything. And that's one city, mm -hmm. one borough of one city, not one city. 40% of all global population is in coastal areas. And it's prohibitively expensive for the richest uh, island in the world, that is Manhattan, to pay for it, let alone for Jakarta, that is sinking underwater, and they want to move it to higher ground. 16 million people, who's going to pay for that, for example? Those are the problems that you have to address when you say climate change, climate mm. change. Yeah, It's yeah. easier said than done. Absolutely. So mitigation implies negative growth. Adaptation costs a fortune. And the third solution that is uh, geoengineering, like throwing dust in the atmosphere so it reflects the sunlight, is freak science. And there's going to have lots of other negative side effects, right? And carbon capture and all of that stuff, again, current technology carbon capture is not competitive. It's not going to do anything. It's going to reduce 1% of those emissions. So everybody says carbon capture and variants of the same. It's a joke right now. Let's be honest about it. Okay. <laughs> Those are the problems you have to address. So yeah. solutions there are, but once you scratch the surface, there are reasons why these things don't happen. Yeah. And this is just one example, and I give you many other, just purely for climate change. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very complex. I, I did want to ask, uh, you know, a last question on central banks. Um, do you think the people running our central banks or the staff are, are less kind of equipped than historically? I mean, is there deficiency in skill or experience in some way? amongst our central bankers right now? Or is it the problem is so large that whoever would have been running the central banks would have the same problem in terms of their remit of managing inflation? I think it's the latter. Yeah, right now you have a bunch of lawyers, yeah. the Fed, the ACB, or Bank of England running it before you had economists like Draghi and Bernanke and yeah. Yellen and Carney, or people in the financial sector like Carney. But guess what? Uh, we had the uh, Greenspan was an economist, Ben Bernanke was an economist, Janet Yellen was an economist, and I have great respect for all three of them. But what happened? Greenspan put, Bernanke put, Yellen put, Powell put, first of all. And uh, the problems are there is so much debt that in addition to fiscal dominance, as I said, there's a debt trap. So they're not stupid, they're not evil, they're super smart, these people. And Powell might be a lawyer, but he has a entire staff of the Fed who gives good advice plus a board that includes 
lots of economists like uh, Williams or like uh, like Leo Brainard, super smart people. The problem is not the, the quality of the of the central bankers. You have a, a massive amount of debt. You are in a debt trap, and you are in fiscal dominance. So you cannot do but monetize it and eventually blink and and wimp out and try yeah. inflation as a way of getting out of this problem. Yeah. Okay. Now I did want to ask a couple of personal questions just to round things off. Um, you know, one one is what's the best investment advice you've ever received from anyone? Uh, well, I was thinking about the investment advice I can give now to people. Okay, give it can be that way around as well. <laughs> yeah. As I said, you know, in a world where inflation is rising, 60, 40 doesn't work because the price of all assets is positively correlated. So even bonds are fall in value when equity does. If you want to protect yourself against inflation, I think the combination of assets you have to think about is short-term treasury, like rather than long duration, because the price action when yields rise is smaller for short duration, the long duration. Two, you need also inflation index bonds like tips in the US. That's one bundle of assets. Second one will be gold and precious metals. Gold so far has not done well because the real rates have been rising and people still believe the central bank are gonna fight inflation. If and when I'm right, the central bank gonna blink and they're gonna wimp out that gold is gonna have that upside when inflation expectation become an anchor. So far, I think they're anchored because people still believe the central banks. Once they don't believe them, they're going to become an anchor. Three, in the 70s, equity do, did very poorly. Real estate also fell in value, but less than equities uh, because you had essentially pricing power for rents and land and infrastructures and commercial residential real estate. This is a limited supply. Right now, there is, for example, a massive surge in rents in the United States, one of the sources of the inflation, given that pricing power. But the caveat on uh, real estate, even REITs that are public, like stocks that are highly liquid, is that the huge amount of uh, real estate assets are gonna be stranded because of global climate change. Even in North America, if you're on the coastline, sea rise level, hurricanes, and so on, climate change. Uh, in the West, droughts, and droughts with wildfires. In the South, too hot to live. In uh, the Mississippi River Valley floods because of, again, uh, weather phenomena. So half of the U.S. in the next 20, 30 years has to move from, they went from New York to Florida, from San Francisco to Austin. You have the reversal. You have to go to the Midwest into Canada, and you have to rebuild communities, commercial real estate, residential real estate, infrastructures, farmland in the Midwest into Canada. So that's going to be the investment opportunity. So short-term mm. treasury, inflation index bond, gold and some other precious metals, uh, maybe other commodities, but there are some caveats on that, and uh, environmentally sustainable real estate. I'm involved into a new project we're going to launch, a new asset management firm, a fintech firm that combines in an optimizing way this combination of assets to deliver returns in positive terms, nominally and really, if there is inflation, if there is debasement of fiat currencies, if there's going to be social, political, and geopolitical turmoil, and if there's going to be climate change. And by the way, political and geopolitical turmoil implies again that you have to go into assets that provide you a hedge against it, like gold, for example. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as we're imposing sanctions not only against Iran, North Korea, and now Russia, but eventually against, uh, against China, those strategic rivals have to find liquid assets that cannot be dollar, but increasingly not even euro, yen, or pound. Because in Russia, we seized also those reserves. Mm. have to be stuff that cannot be seized by the West. So gold, not in the vault of the New York Fed, of course. Gold <laughs> in the vault of Beijing or Moscow, not even in London, is one of those safe assets. And when inflation gets an inch, gold is going to do well. Yeah. Some of those assets recently, like real estate and gold, have not done well because we've had these rising real rates. It is hurting those assets. Yeah. But because we still have credibility on inflation. Once that credibility is done, is gone, then you'll have those assets going up in value, gold and the right types of real estate, in addition to tips and short-term yeah. treasure, of course. So that will be my financial advice. <laughs> okay, great. And, you know, there's a segment of our audience who are young, young people who are just leaving university now. And yeah. after listening to everything you just said, um, if, if, if you're a young person, you just finished university, you're entering the job market, 
I mean, what, what would you tell them? What advice would you give them? You know, eventually most jobs are going to be replaced by technology. <laughs> okay. But those that are not going to be replaced by technology have to do with STEM, science, uh, technology, engineering, mathematics, and of course, anything to do with computer science, big data, AI, machine learning, and so on. So many jobs are going to be created in those things. Eventually, even those jobs are going to be done better by machines, but it's going to be later stage, not, mm-hmm. not initially. So my view is, you know, this debate, if you're a young person, what you should study in college or university, I would say you should major in STEM and a minor in uh, liberal arts because you still have to know how to read, write, think critically <laughs> and so on. So you need a combination of the two. But if you have only liberal arts, you're not going to know anything about technology. It'll become obsolete. If you do too much of only technology, you're just a bit of a geek or a nerd or, or a wonk, and you need a broader intellectual framework to understand this world and survive it. So a combination of the two with more emphasis on STEM rather than others. And if you didn't do it in college, you can learn. This mm-hmm. world, uh, having the same job, the same career, in the same firm, in the same profession, is not going to happen anymore like it was for you and me. Mm-hmm. I became an economist at the age of 16, literally, when I studied <laughs> economics, and I've been still an economist, still in school, never graduated. <laughs> I'm still a professor, right? <laughs> but for most people, they have to try jobs, career, profession, even where you live and work and so on. So you have to be nimble and flexible. If you haven't done it in college, you can still retain yourself. Get a graduate degree. There are online courses where you can learn how to become in the jobs of the future. And there are going to be some jobs of the future before the machine take over humanity. <laughs> it's going to happen, but for the time being, you can survive. Okay, now fi- final question for you was, um, you're obviously a very well-read person. I mean, what, what are some of the books that really influenced you as a thinker? Well, you know, apart from the usual economics books, I would say increasingly I had to learn about uh, uh, other disciplines, including politics and geopolitics. I would say the book by Graham Allison, on uh, um, Destined to War, Will U.S. and China Avoid the Two Cities Trap, is a very important framework for understanding whether this Cold War is going to become a hot war or not. And now I worry about the World War III. And it's not just U.S. and China. It's the possibility of a conflict between Russia, Ukraine now escalating towards NATO mm. and in a nuclear, non conventional way. And the risk that Iran becoming nuclear is going to force Israel and the US to strike. Mm. So, literally, you could have, in some sense, my fear is that World War III has already started, started in Ukraine. And in the next mm. couple of years, could be Iran. In the next five to 10 years, it's going to be US and China on Taiwan. There was an article today on the front page of the Financial Times saying that the uh, U.S. administration view is that uh, Xi Jinping is going to lurch to try to take over Taiwan faster than we expected, mean, meaning within the next decade rather than later. Because the more they wait, the more we can mm. essentially defend with weapons Taiwan. So the moment is sooner rather than later. And there was a piece by Edward Luce on the Financial Times today saying that now the policy of the U.S. towards China is containment, the Biden policy. Before was we cooperate, we compete, and we confront each other. We are trying on China a containment policy like we did towards the Soviet mm. Union. The recent decision about restricting all semiconductor exports in some critical industries to China is a declaration of economic and technological war. We may need to do it to prevent China essentially from dominating AI, machine learning, robotic automation, history of the future, but it's a declaration of economic and technological war. And when those things happen, it has political and geopolitical consequences. So remember it, you heard it first year, <laughs> World War III probably has already started. Mm-hmm. Wow, very uh, somber message from you. And um, I'm not quite sure how to, you know, continue a conversation with that. that. Uh, so let's end, end it there on that very somber note. Um, you have uh, this book coming out, which I'll include a link on the show notes. And if people want to follow your thinking in general, uh, what, what's the best way for people to follow you? Certainly reading the books, I think, is the one thing they should be doing. Everybody should be reading it. It's not self-serving. I think it's really an important yeah. book, the best I've written. I write a regularly a column for Project Syndicate once a month, okay. and it's published on The Guardian in the UK and in 100 or plus magazines around the world. Those who really are want my own research. I have an economic research service like you do. 
Rubini Macro Associates, but it's for people that are, you know, institutional investors who want a more sophisticated economic and financial and policy analysis. I have also a service called the boombast.com to try to see when uh, asset prices for key asset prices are either overbought or oversold. A combination of uh, both uh, qualitative macro analysis and some uh, fundamental quantitative analysis as well. And, you know, I speak uh, in public. There are plenty of talks that I give that are freely available on YouTube and other platforms. Mm -hmm. And I give interviews uh, right and left. So there are many ways of essentially. And, and uh, you mentioned a, a project you're involved in um, about these investments that kind of hedge yourself yeah. against lots of risk. What's the name of that, uh, that yeah, uh, company? Yeah, that's called the Atlas. Atlas uh, okay. We're going to be launching, first of all, an index within the next few weeks. <coughs> we're working with Goldman Sachs on designing it and then executing it. On this index, you'll be able to do total return swaps to take positions. It's more of a product for large institutional investors. Uh, then we'll create an ETF that has essentially the same underlying optimized assets, short-term treasury tips, gold, and sustainable real estate. We're using an AI model, big data, to figure out which mm -hmm. REITs are sustainable, which are not. Very sophisticated stuff nobody is doing. And eventually, there'll be one form of it also on a digital platform, uh, some form of a blockchain, uh, but the point is most of the stuff in crypto is vaporware, is backed by nothing. This will be a security token. And you know, at every point in time, what's the value of that token? Because the underlying assets are all liquid assets, gold, treasuries, and uh, public grids. So yeah. it's going to be something fully backed. So you know what the value of the assets are and they're all liquid as well. So those will be the three manifestation of the same idea. Yeah. So initially products for institutional investors. But you know, you have $20 trillion of fixed income. And this year, around the world that is dollar related, either it's dollar treasury, spread related to dollar in yen, corporate, high yield, high grade, and even gilts, even bonds, even other 10-year uh, treasuries are all correlated with the dollar because there's inflation and common factors of global liquidity. So those assets this year have lost on average 30% because 10-year treasury has gone from less than 1% to today around 4.2%. That's more than 30% loss in the price of it. So safe assets have lost more money than, say, S&P that has lost only 25% this year. That's why if you have 60-40, if you have 70-30, even if you have risk parity, there's a variant of 70-30, right, with yeah. vol and VIX adjusting the weight, you are exposed to fixed income that is going to be wiped out by inflation. You have to start to think about this uh, mm. concept that we have as an alternative to fixed income, to hedge inflation, the basement of fiat currencies, and give you a nominal real return that hedges you against that. that yeah. That's the idea. And we'll be launching it uh, in the next month or so. Okay, I'll include a link uh, to Call that as well. Atlas. Atlas. Yeah, Atlas, yeah. I'll include a link to that as well. Well, with that, I mean, we've covered so many different topics um, with a you know, slightly negative uh, you know, tone to it all. Um, but realistic. Realistic, absolutely, yeah. The yeah. book doesn't say you are crazy. Say absolutely, those are real threats. Yeah. And of course, agreement on how much, how severe, how fast, and how slow. Yeah, yeah. I don't think anybody would uh, disagree that these are real threats. No, correct, yeah. So th thanks a lot. That was an excellent conversation. And uh, yeah, good, good luck with everything. Uh, such a pleasure being with you today. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five-star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then. <laughs>